This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. The biggest, the biggest icon in podcasting. To this week's episode of Doc and Jock, I am the Doc, John Macaroon. Everything made possible thanks to the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Got a great show today. My co-host, Adam the Jock Strozinski, should be the happiest man in town. I bet when we go to him, he's going to be super excited. His squad really, I think, played at the level that you want to see in collegiate football when you have a rivalry game, the game, and your team, the Michigan Wolverines, perform at that level, all good things to talk about because when you go to Columbus, there's an expectation that it's going to be a really tough environment, a rabid environment, but the Wolverines walked into Columbus and pimp slapped the Buckeyes. Tears flowing, the shocked faces of the supporters of the Buckeyes. Michigan walked in there, played their brand of football, and boy, they impressed every single person that tuned in and watched that game. Cause how excited are you today? Let it ride, baby. Take this, take the stage and enjoy the opportunity to gloat. Because boy, Michigan looks like one of the top two teams in the entire country. Yeah, and I think what you said holds true. They went into Columbus and they played their brand of football, their style of football. Something that I questioned the previous week on this very show. They went into Columbus, played their style of football, let it rip, and you know what? It looks like they took the soul of Ohio State. It looks like Jim Harbaugh has basically arisen to the mountaintop, and the Big Ten is his. It's his for the taking. And you know, look, I don't do this often because I'm usually the one burying the Michigan program because I don't like a lot of the things that Jim Har- Jamar Harbaugh has done. But what he has constructed over the last eight years appears to be a well-oiled machine. They lost a lot of talent last year. A lot of big-name guys who produced for them went into the NFL. They reloaded. They came back this year. And you can argue that this team is poised to win a national championship. And this team is better than last year's team. I think what you got on Saturday was you've seen the culmination of what he's been kind of putting together, not just over the last eight years, but more specifically over the last two years. We questioned whether or not J.J. would take those needed steps forward, whether he'd be able to pass the ball, whether he'd be able to find wide receivers open downfield and hit big plays. You know what? He did. Guess what? Blake Corum, your best player, a a Heisman hopeful. He ends up missing the game, comes out, plays two plays, and he's sidelined. You lose your best player. Everybody's scratching their head. I'll be honest with you. I was nervous. I was scared. I was texting you before I was totally inebriated and, and, and just lathered up in, 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 the, in the gold and in, in blue butter. So, uh, look, you lose your best player in the midst of this game, and they've stopped your run. Like, you can't run the ball to save your life. What do you end up doing? You end up opening a can, and you're hitting big plays down the field, and, and you're passing on them at will. J.J. looked like a, 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 a competent quarterback. He looked like the guy that we all wanted to see all season long. He showed up in the biggest moment. They then go to take your pass away. And then what happens? The run game that wasn't there all day all of a sudden appears, and you're breaking off monstrous runs down the field. This team was an absolute buzzsaw on Saturday. Ryan Day had zero answers for anything. On top of it, this defense – just bludgeons you, just absolutely bludgeons you and breaks you. C.J. Stroud, like going into going into the NFL draft, he was a he was a guy who was arguably the, the, one of the top two quarterbacks. He was supposed to go somewhere in the top three. After this game, I think you see a lot of errors and a lot of mistakes with C.J. Stroud. A lot of things that might be able to be corrected at the next level, but man, he looked frustrated. He looked out of sorts. Looked like he was forcing the ball. He looked a mess. And that's because that defense just gets in your face and frustrates you. And look, ecstatic with what took place on Saturday. Super pumped. That game 
is what I think all Michigan fans have wanted to see all year long. They wanted to see this team come out and play a complete game. This team stuck with it through the first half, right? The big question going into it is, can this team can this team weather the first half? Because they haven't played well in any first half this season. They end up hanging close with Ohio State, and they come out in the second half, and they just open up a can. Ohio State scored three points. I think Michigan scored, what, 28? Like, it, it's, it's unreal. It's absolutely unreal. On top of that, just looking at the scoreboard, this was Michigan's best opponent. This is the best team that they've played all year long. They put up the fourth highest point total against their, 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 their best opponent. That says a lot about a team. That says a lot about a team that has bought into what this coaching staff wants to do. And it says a lot about this team being able to execute and do it on the road. Do it in a place that has basically crippled you. You haven't won there in over 20 years. That's crazy. That's crazy. If you are a if you're a 20-year-old kid, you've never seen Michigan win in Columbus. Like, let that sink in. That's nuts. Over half my life, they haven't been able to win in Columbus. Like, that's bonkers, man. This team went in there and and punched Ohio State in the mouth. And honestly, I think they took the hearts out of what used to be the champions of the Big Ten. The Big Ten ran through Ohio State no longer. No more does it go through Columbus. At this moment in time, you have to go through Ann Arbor if you're looking to play for a Big Ten championship, if you're looking to make the college football playoff. And I think that says a lot. A couple years ago, we were ready to give up on Jim Harbaugh. I specifically was calling for him to be fired. This guy, over the last two years, has cultivated a program, has cultivated a culture, and, and has this thing rolling. This team looks like it should win a national championship with the performance it put on on Saturday. Yeah, we're going to talk all about it. I definitely want to get your sense of what it was like being at the bar. I know you get lathered up. It's exciting. But I'll say this, too. Again, I thought mano a mano when two teams that are, are of that caliber, these are the two best teams in the Big Ten, and it's going to be this way probably for the next two or three years. I think Mel Tucker will get his foothold into things. Now you're going to see Luke, uh, Luke Fickle get into the Big Ten. Matt Rule now into Big the Big Ten. Big Ten definitely got stronger. Yes, the conference got stronger. I think all across the board, there's going to be heavy competition to catch these two squads. But when it's a game of that magnitude, I think coaching certainly matters. I was so upset at a couple things that Ryan Day did. He fucked around in the first half and tried to do some things that I think derailed the momentum of the Buckeyes. And then I think the play of the game happened late when, you know, they went backwards. Ohio State got a stretch there where they were just really, it was uh, first, second, third, and long. And all of a sudden they uh, ran a couple plays and then it's fourth down. Stroud looks to the sideline and you punt it? What the fuck are you doing? You you trust your defense? I don't understand at that point. You move the ball. You needed like, what, 35 yards? You got like 25 of them in two plays, just Michigan giving it to you. And Stroud looks over to the sideline and you bring him, you bring CJ Stroud to the sideline. Are you kidding me right now? I thought that Ryan Day coached to lose. And it, it, it really took on a manner of a football team that got nervous at the big moment. And it's very rare that you see that in college football where the moment gets so big that it palpitates from the coach all the way to the players. But I felt like in a different circumstance, what on earth are you doing playing two, uh, playing without safeties against Michigan? Are you kidding me right now? You got to have at least a safety valve where if you do bring pressure and you don't get there, you don't have Donovan Edwards not once but twice running free you're and and what bothers me is when it comes out that the defensive coordinator of Ohio State has spent the entire year basically brought in to coach defense for Michigan that's what Big 12 football taught you that's where you where you came from taught you how to play defense when you spend bro, that much time coming that's up with the, the game problem. plan bro i thought uh, uh it was shades of don brown with ohio state trying to get out there and play defense it was disheartening because i felt if if ryan day handled the situation differently then uh, then this game could have turned out much different. It could have been much more competitive. But boy, you know, you ha- we all have to eat crow. But I do want to say this. How much credit are you giving J.J. McCarthy? Because his receivers got into the situation where you say to yourself, look, I know it's still tough to hit open receivers, but if your receiver is galloping three f- yards open 
and you're a quarterback, you're expected to hit him. So I can't give J.J. all that much credit because obviously Cornelius Johnson made a defender miss, and then obviously he got five yards open. So I give him credit for being elusive, and the element of his uh, mobility definitely makes him a top-notch quarterback. But in terms of the passing, I don't think that uh, he did enough to cement where I say, oh, he's going to go into the SEC and do that against Georgia. But man, I can't believe, and we haven't seen it too often, Jim Harbaugh outcoached Ryan Day. No, absolutely. He put together a game plan that, like I said, took the heart away from Ryan Day, took the heart away from Ohio State, and and beat them up. And look, this is what I'll say about J.J. McCarthy. He still has to execute. This has been the biggest issue with him all season, is the wide receivers have been open. They've been wide open down the field, more than three yards, sometimes five yards wide open down the field, and he's either overthrown, underthrow them, or he's just completely missed them. In this game, he actually executed. So I'm going to give him credit for executing on those plays because there have been times this season, pretty much all throughout the season, where he has missed those plays. This was a game where he did not miss those passes. He hit them when he needed to hit them. He came up absolutely clutch when they needed him. And look, this is what I'll say about, about Jim Harbaugh. There is something to be said about what this team and what last year's team represent. And you kind of compare that to what Ohio State has kind of brought to the plate the last two, the last two seasons. Michigan is a team that is, is going to fight you. They are going to punch you. They are going to kick you. They are going to knock you down. And they're expecting to get hit back. Ohio State looks like it's an absolute finesse team right now. Ohio State doesn't have, a, have any grit, doesn't have any sandpaper to them. Ohio State seems, dare I say, soft, whereas Michigan looks much more hardened, much more ready to get in into the trenches and mix it up with you, ready to break your will. And that's kind of where I think this, this rivalry has gone. And I think this game is the swing game. I think Michigan broke Ohio State, broke the rivalry, and has broken their will. Michigan has taken this rivalry back. Now, look, I know it's only two games, and I'm not trying to get on, on my pulpit here and, and, and preach about it because it's only been two games. But what I've seen in both of these games is Ohio State gets punched in the mouth, and Ohio State can't come back. Ohio State can't answer. If you look at the first half, it was, it was, it was a couple of big plays here or there. Ohio State's up. They're riding high. And then you come back in the second half, and they just don't have any answers. They don't have the ability to answer, whether it's a gut check or, or whether it's just you don't have the players. And look, I think we both agree Ohio State has some fantastic players. You can look at all the guys in the NFL this year doing big things. They have players. They have talent. But I don't know if they have that tenacity, and I don't know if they have that grit, and I don't know if they have that sandpaper. And I think that's where this game is won. It's been a very long time since we can question whether or not Ohio State is soft or not. Ohio State is absolutely soft right now. Michigan is not. It's, it's weird because I've lived through this with Michigan, right? I lived through the Hulk era. I, I lived through D'Antonio beating the piss out of Michigan and, and, and all the excuses that would come out of Ann Arbor. Uh, I, I lived through Brady Hoke just kind of looking like he scratched his head just at a loss. And it's funny to see Ohio State now basically in that same exact role, in that same exact position. Ryan Day's at a loss, has no idea, basically pleading with the, with the college football playoff committee, saying, hey, if you put us in, we're going to give you a good game. Are you? Are you really? Because this was your best opponent that you faced all season. This was the best team that you've seen. And you guys didn't have a pulse. So I, I don't know if you'll give us a good game if you make it to the college football playoff. He's out here politicking for that, whereas before it was just, yeah, we're punching our own ticket. You can't take it from us. And at this point, Ohio State, you, you, you've got guys who, who just look completely baffled and bewildered on the field. It, it, it has swung so mightily in, in basically one game. This game was, was, the, was the switch that got flipped, man. Absolutely nuts. The one thing I did not like about this game is I did not like the 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 the, the Michigan Wolverines planting the flag in the middle of of Ohio State's field. I did not like that. I didn't think that was necessarily needed. But uh, honestly, man, at this moment in time, this team really feels like it is built to be a national championship contender. It feels like this team 
is going to go in, and I'm going to say it right now, it's going to be Michigan-Georgia for the Natty. And I think Michigan has a good chance to beat Georgia. I think they have a really good chance. I think this team is tough on defense. I think this team does a lot of different things that make it hard on quarterbacks and make it hard on running backs. I think where Georgia might get the edge offensively versus Michigan's defense is with the tight ends. And I think Michigan offensively, again, take the pass away. That's fine. We'll run the ball. Take the run game away. That's fine. We'll pass the ball. I think Michigan has found a couple of wide receivers. This was another question we had last week. I think they found a couple of wide receivers in this game. And again, J.J. McCarthy answered a lot of questions on whether or not he can complete passes down the field and make big plays for this team because he did it this past weekend. Yeah, it was great. I had an opportunity to talk to Jim Harbaugh. Not a lot of people uh, uh, w- wanted to on a Sunday at 3 o'clock. I was watching football because the Lions were off. They invited me to talk to both coaches of the teams that are going to participate in the Big Ten Championship game in Indy. Obviously sat back and listened a little bit to Jeff Brom of Purdue, then obviously uh, Jim Harbaugh, and then you start realizing, okay, the normal people that normally would ask, the beat writers, one did, and then I'm like, you know, I have a chance to ask a question. So the first one was nice and easy for myself. I just asked them, hey, what's your initial thoughts? Because they came to me right away, raised my hand, and uh, right away they came to me. So I asked Jim Harbaugh about his thoughts about playing Purdue, and he gave the typical coach's answer, and then the PR guy was kind of fishing for more questions. So I'm like, oh my gosh, I have a direct line here to just kind of ask whatever the hell I want. So I said, you know, and I couched it nicely. I said, uh, you know, Jim, it's obviously a heated rivalry. You know how this situation goes between both squads. Did you see your team plant the flag? And he's like, yeah, man. He's like, he's like, yeah, I wish we could grab that flag and place it in our museum. And then I paused because it was quick, and then he, the guy said— and, and it had the PR guy not said, hey, do you have a follow-up, John? I would not have asked, but he. I said, you know what? Yeah, Jim, I'm just wondering. It's a heated rivalry. You know this kind of uh, situation with planting the flag can maybe raise the stakes and, and, and up the uh, you know heat in this rivalry. Do you find it any way to be like, you know, not standard or disrespectful? And I actually, to be honest, he, he, he didn't fish around it. He didn't give a typical coach's answer. And it was one of the times Jim, I think, now has kind of opened up a little bit more with the media. He looked me right in the face and basically through Zoom said, listen, John, to be honest with you, can this rivalry really get that much hotter? He's like, they have songs that basically say we hate the whole state of Michigan. He's like, it's all good. And I respected that. It was a good question and a great answer. He said, look, the the rivalry is not going to get that much hotter. These are two teams that hate each other. It's not going to get that much that hotter. It, it is what it is. And I loved it. It showed bravado. He has his team out there. You kick their ass. Would I have had my team do that? No, because of course it's going to piss off Ohio State and it's going to add more. That could be something that, you know, moving forward could be used as motivation from Ohio State. But I think Michigan right now with J.J. McCarthy, it's one of those situations where you're playing from ahead and you got got a great run game. You got great coaching. You can kind of do that situation from the mountaintop. So I respected that answer. But for Michigan, they don't care. They are going to do that kind of stuff. Because it's their rival. They are going to be uh, braggadocious. They're going to puff out their chest. And they're going to celebrate when the time is right. And they earned it. So uh, if you don't want Michigan to plant the flag in the middle. Now, for me, the one thing that was crazy is if I'm standing there and I'm wearing a red jersey and I'm from Ohio State and I see that, I'm, I don't care. I'm going up there and I'm, I'm starting to push. I'm starting to tackle. I'm like, you guys want to start something? Ain't going to be nothing here. You're not putting uh, no flag in my field. We're going to have a problem. See, and look. Th- that That is basically what I'm saying. The mentality of both of these teams, right? Ohio State, just go ahead, do whatever you want. Just soft, right? Just, 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 you want to take yeah. over, take over. You took over our stadium, fine, whatever. Michigan, on the other hand, Michigan seems like they have a completely different mentality than any Michigan team I can remember. Maybe you have to go back as far as the 1997 team. Because that team just, just had the mentality of, this is our game, you're not going to take this from us. If you want it, you better come and you better come loaded because we're ready for you. That's what this team feels like to me. It doesn't feel like at any point there's anything that really rattles them, anything that really shakes them. And they they look, they limp into these second halves, right? Like they they're 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 not blowing anybody out in the first half. It's always a close game going into halftime, and it's like a switch gets flipped. It's like all of a sudden something happens in the second half and this team comes out and they're built for war. I, I don't know if you can play that quality of football and win a national championship. I don't know if you could do that against a team like Georgia. But what I'm telling you is 
This team is put together, and it is special. The fact that you can play close games, you can go on the road, you can go to your arch nemesis's house, a place that you can't ever seem to win. Like I said, the last 20 years, I haven't been able to win there. And you're down going into halftime, and you come out, and you just put an ass whipping on. It's like they're never rattled. They're always ready for the big moment. And I think that's awesome. That's something that we haven't been able to say about this Michigan team. You go back two years ago, three years ago, we were always talking about how in the biggest moments, Jim Harbaugh got small. How, how when the spotlight was the brightest, he shrunk. And how he, was, he would just clutch his clipboard and he would make the wrong call. You're not seeing that anymore. You're not seeing it. it it's, it's like a completely different brand of Michigan football than what we had the previous six years. It's bonkers to me. Yeah, I, I'm impressed. I think it's winning football. You can play defense. I was talking to a buddy, and we said, "Yeah, can do you, do you see Michigan competing against Georgia?" And he said, "It's just hard to believe it until you see it because it's such a, a step up in competition from the Big Ten. It's pro ball. You're playing it against is. defensive linemen who all can run to the quarterback. Well, You're playing wide receivers who all have breakaway speed. Now, it, it, it is no, it is like it, it, that's a good point." It is, it's a different caliber, right? Yes. But you have to remember, Georgia lost a shit ton yes, they last did. year. Georgia put a ton of dudes in the NFL. And I don't know if this Georgia team that beat the piss out of Michigan is better than last year's team. I would say it's probably a notch below that. And that being said, I think Michigan's a couple notches above where they were last year. So if they do meet for the national championship, like I do believe that they will, I think it's going to be a hell of a football game. I uh, think it's going to be a great football game, and I can see Michigan winning by three. Are you scared at all, TCU, and what they bring no. to the table? Because if, if, if Michigan ends up number two, they'll face number three, TCU. Maybe four will be USC. I know you don't want any part of USC because that quarterback might USC be one either. of those rare talents no. that understands the system nope, and might be able afraid. to lift a team not and put them up Look, on his shoulder by himself. Know? The only team that makes me question anything is Georgia. And that's just because I respect what they did to Michigan last yep. year, and I respect what they've done for the past two years. USC doesn't scare me. Yeah, they've got a quarterback who's probably going to win the Heisman Trophy. But other than that, I don't think they have much else. I, I don't think that that their their offensive line is great. I think Michigan can exploit that. Uh, I don't think that, that any of their wide receivers are exceptional. I think their quarterback will actually – Get them some points, but I think he'll also put them in a spot where he'll probably turn the ball over, and it might result in six going the other way. Uh, defensively, they don't scare me. I think Michigan, their offensive line is so good, so good. It provides J.J. enough time to pass the ball if, he, if he's going to pass. You see what they can do when they're running. I think by the time all this kind of rolls around, you'll have Blake Corum back, so that run game will be back to where it should be. Uh, I, I think that with this with this past weekend's game, I think it has basically solidified everything for this team. Everybody is comfortable in their roles because, again, the biggest question mark we had was what J what was JJ going to be able to do when when some of that pressure got put on him when things got dialed up. He arose to the occasion. He looked like the guy that everybody's been telling us about for for over a year and a half now. So look, nobody scares me. The only team that, that that makes me a little bit nervous is Georgia, and that's, again, because I respect what they did last year, and I respect what they've done the past two years. I don't give a shit about TCU or USC. Gotcha. No, it's good. It's going to be a fun time, man. But I think you'll handle business. should be a 14-point a, a win or more against Purdue, but it'll be fun to see. Maybe the spoiler makers will make it a fun Saturday night, at least keep it competitive into the second half, but I think it's going to be a fun back-to-back -back Big Ten championship season for Michigan. Now, coming away, a lot of people, surprising, a lot of people direct messaged us at Detroit Podcast and were like, man, when they looked at C.J. Stroud and what he was able to do, they just said, well, he just kind of looks like just a, maybe just a hair more mobile than Jared Goff. And I was like, yeah, I'm out. I'm out on C.J. Stroud. I saw him play at Michigan State and he looked okay, but he didn't look like a world beater. And then in, in the biggest moment, in the biggest game, he didn't have his best performance. He never beat Michigan, didn't rise to the occasion. Maybe that can fuel him at the next level. But a lot of people messaged and said, man, he, he kind of looks like Goff in the way he throws the ball and, and the manner in which he conducts himself. But I just think he's going to fall by the wayside as, as one of those Ohio State quarterbacks like Haskins that just when they get to the league mm -hmm. might bounce around a little bit. But I think he hurt his draft stock. And the Lions, in my opinion, should be way out on C.J. Stroud. I don't think that you need a quarterback from Ohio State. You need somebody from the SEC. I, and the Lions have been heavy recruiting Florida, so Richardson might be on their radar. I just think Stroud 
off the Lions draft board based on that performance against Michigan. You can't play like that. You got to step it up. You got to lead your team. And I don't care, come hell or high water, when your coach takes you off the field, you need to be finger pointing and making it so that you stay on the field. You make your coach call a play, not just hand it over to your defense that struggled all in the second half so that you can lose the game. Put the ball in my hands. He looked like he was confused and shocked that Ryan Day would ever in a million years not let him do it, but trust your defense. Yeah, okay, man. In, in, in college football, in this day and age where offense rules supreme in both in both, in both both games, the NFL and college football, you're going to trust your defense? I'm out on C.J. Stroud, and they better not they better not earn the second pick because that will just put the uh, the target right on the line's back to potentially take one of the quarterbacks. Yeah, look, I don't know what's going to happen with C.J. Stroud, but this is what I'll say about him. He seems like he's a quarterback who who has a really nice touch with a long down-the-field pass, right? He seems like he can really take a top off of a defense. Doesn't seem incredibly mobile. Has... Like I said, has that big arm to be able to get it to get it down the field, but really seems to wilt when the pressure's dialed up and really seems to make a lot of questionable decisions. In this game, when things were collapsing in and around him and he couldn't get away and he he couldn't necessarily find a wide open wide receiver. And remember, that's important. This guy plays with guys, and he's played with guys basically his entire career who are next level at the next level. Like you look at all the guys who are going in, like all the top wide receivers, all the top wide receivers are basically coming out of Ohio State. So he plays with these wide receivers who are are exceptional talents, right? And if he can't get the ball to them because they can't get open, they can't get that separation, he's trying to force the ball. It's resulting in turnovers. When you make it to the NFL, you can't do that. You can't like we, we, we all bag on Jared Goff for for sometimes doing things like this. We all rip Matt Stafford for trying to force balls into weird places. You can't do that at the next level. It, it just doesn't work. So, look, I'm out on C.J. Stroud as well, unless you can get him much later. I'm not I'm not investing a one. If, if that Rams pick ends up being a top three pick, I'm not investing in C.J. Stroud. Just not doing it. So it's going to be interesting to kind of see where he ends up and what kind of happens with his draft status. Because like you said, in the two biggest games of his career, he has looked really, really human. And and again, Ohio State doesn't have a fantastic track record with putting quarterbacks in the league. You know, Dwayne Haskins is a prime example. You know, Justin Fields kind of getting his stride right now, but it's because all he's doing is running around. Like he's just, he's basically a, a, a running quarterback who who's being asked to throw the ball 15 times a game. That's not necessarily what you want. You'd like a guy who has wheels and can move, but you need to be able to throw the ball a little bit more than 15 times a game. So it, it'll be interesting to kind of see what happens. It, it, you know, things with the lions, Hey, look, it wouldn't surprise me if they took C.J. Stroud. I don't Ooh. want them to, and I'm out on it. Wouldn't surprise me, though. Okay. No, it, it was a, a good opportunity to evaluate. Man, a lot of people from Michigan stepped up, played a great game. Donovan Edwards, I mean, not one, but two runs of over 70 yards. Are you kidding me right Dude, now? with a broken hand. With a broken hand. Blake Corum, a trooper, still tries to get out there despite his situation. You're able to play at that level. Now, look, the Big Ten is not the best it ever was, but it's still an Ohio State team that was 11-0 and and had a lot of weapons. I just think that there was a bad sign for me as well when Marvin Harrison dropped that football. Uh, the, the normally sure-handed Marvin Harrison drops a football, and you're like, oh, oh you know, that's not good. And so the, the pressure sometimes gets to them. They're, these are college kids. And all credit to Michigan who have now been able to step up and perform at the highest level and now you have the world at your feet. You're going to be showcased nationally. Uh, the craziest part, and this will be the, the last thing maybe before we head and, and talk to the Lions, you had four, I think I read four recruits that were visiting Ohio State said, oh, we want to go to Michigan. <laughs> what level of satisfaction does the Michigan program get from knowing that recruits went to visit Ohio State and ended up signing up with Michigan? That's just the height of of a compliment that Michigan deserves at this point in time. And maybe uh, all of us screaming for Jim Harbaugh's head. Uh, He did take a pay cut, so he did face consequences, and he did make changes. He adapted. He brought in and let others do their job and uh, adapted his coaching style to fit what was going on. So it'll be good to see where Jim Harbaugh now takes his program in years uh, 7, 8, 9, 10 moving forward and see 
who catches up first? Is it Nebraska? Is it uh, Wisconsin? Is it Michigan State? Let's see. Is it is it Ohio State who doubles down and says, oh, we got to man up and, and get beefier and, and handle our business? So I can't wait to see it. It's going to be fun, man. College football, we got a nice, nice weekend of college football, and it's only going to get better as the playoff um, um, the playoff arrives and we can see who w- which four teams are going to fill out the college football playoff. Now, we got to switch gears. We do got to talk to... Uh, talk about the Lions. I know it stinks in that a lot of people took the moral victory stance with that game against the Bills because they penciled it in as a loss. Not me. I was upset a little bit because the Lions had a chance to win it. I felt like the coaching blunders really, uh, in my mind, took it to a level where you you gave the Bills more of an opportunity to score points at the end of the first half and then the end of the game there, even if it's 20 seconds. And yeah, credit Josh Allen for making that play with only 23 seconds left, but you did not do everything possible in regards to the clock, in regards to making the the game management work in your favor. Now it's a strategy, you know, a couple things we're going to talk about, obviously that third down play. Uh, I'm trying to put that aside for a couple minutes because it pisses me off, but Dan Campbell, again, controversial game management decisions. I think the first half situations running two plays before the two minute warning was more egregious than the end of the game. But again, the clock management is a storyline coming out of this loss, close loss to the bills. Yeah. And I think the thing that you can take out of this game is this team feels like it's almost there, right? And by almost there, I don't mean playing for a Super Bowl or, or contending for a Super Bowl, but being able to play with the big boys, being a well-balanced enough team to be able to go out there and, and, and handle anybody, not necessarily be afraid of anybody. You know, the, the, as Lions fans, there are some games where you're just like, I don't want to play them. Just don't want You know it's going to be an ass whip and, and you're just ready to take your medicine. That wasn't it with this game. I think everybody went into this game with a little bit of confidence. The hope was that they would that they wouldn't be embarrassed, that they would play up to a certain level. Well, you know what they did? They played above that level. They should have won this game. And what this game tells you is they are almost there. But coaching missteps again cost this team. Coaching missteps have cost this team at least Four games, if my count's correct. Dan Campbell in his time mismanagement and and not being quick to to pull the trigger on a play call or two has cost this team yet again. And look, I want to like Dan Campbell. I want Dan Campbell to succeed. I want this Lions team to succeed. But you keep having the same mistakes. And in this game specifically, you screwed up at halftime. And then you screwed up at the very end of the game. And you put your team in bad spots. And and then if you listen to, to his explanation for what he was thinking about doing, it just makes absolutely no sense. It, it's like he doesn't even understand what's coming out of his mouth. Listening to, to what he wanted to do at the end of the half, like what you said, a little bit more egregious, taking two plays before the two-minute warning, basically giving the Bills the ball back so they could go down the field and, and kick a field goal. Like... What are you doing? How about you hold on to the ball? How about you try to score a touchdown or get some points, maybe kick a field goal, and then don't give Buffalo the ball back so they can go down and get points. You do realize that you are kicking the ball off to them to start the half. And then you look at what happens at the at the very end of the game. And, and look, at the very end of the game, this team had a chance to put this game away. This team had a chance to solidify everything. And everybody wants to focus on the third and one call. And there's a lot of people that you could hold responsible for this. You could hold Dan Campbell responsible for this. You can hold uh, uh, the offensive coordinator responsible for for this. You could hold uh, Jared Goff responsible for it. And, and I think for me, for me, I think Jared Goff result, re- deserves a much more blame than 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 just about anybody else because. I think it was the right play call. Now, it's not what I would have done. I would have preferred them to run the ball, pick up the one yard. But if you look at the way the play broke down, Shane Zilstra is running wide open down the middle of the field. There's not a player around him. The play should have went to Zilstra down the middle of the field instead of going to to Shark 
down the right side. And I think that's where the big issue is. Like, like you can question Dan Campbell in, in, in wanting to go for the kill shot on, on third and one, right? When they really should have just picked up the first down, and then you could have came back and you could do whatever you wanted to do. But if you go back and you watch that play, you watch it unfold, there is nobody, nobody around your tight end. And your tight end has proven time and time again that he's got good hands. Pass him the ball. There's nobody around him. Nobody. Instead, they try to throw it all the way down the field. And look, Shark beat his man. Absolutely beat him. And there was some miscommunication between Shark and, and, and Jared Goff. And again, that falls more on Goff again. But it, it's just it, it's frustrating to see the continuous mismanagement come back and bite this team in the ass time in and time out. Four games, four games feel like they lay at Dan Campbell's feet. If I would have told you that, I don't know, if they win, if they win two of those four games, how much better do you feel about this team? How much more in control of their own destiny does this team feel? How much better does this team look if two of those four games, if Dan Campbell doesn't cost them half the games, it's unreal. Unreal. If if you were to beat, let's say, the Eagles, and you were to beat, let's say, let's say the Bills, those are the two teams that are penciled in as one and two to win the Super Bowl. You were to beat the two favorites to win the Super Bowl. What does that say about your team? What does it say about where you're at? Not 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 to mention that Minnesota game where it really felt like you had them served up dead on a platter and then you revived them back to life just so they could win. So it, it, to me, it's incredibly frustrating that Dan Campbell, for everything good that he does and for as up as these guys play for him, he still keeps shooting them in the foot. And this time he did it twice, twice in one game. And that is frustrating. Yeah, very frustrating because it's just a philosophical difference that we have no control of. He wants to you know, try to balance scoring quickly and at the same time, not for he doesn't want to force his opponent to use their timeouts. It's crazy in Which regards no to sense. the clock like, management situation that's upset a lot of people in regards to why are you calling offensive plays with over two minutes left? Why are you doing that? And you look at it and you say to yourself, okay, it's a philosophical difference in that he wants to be aggressive. He's go, go, go. Bleeding the clock is not his thing. Hopefully it emerges to be his thing because we all feel like it's become costly. But that's what happens, and that's where everybody's pissed off in games like we talked about earlier in the podcast that are close. Coaching sometimes comes down to uh, the end result is going to come down to just a couple small coaching decisions, and the Lions aren't making the top ones. It's unbelievable uh, in regards to Dan Campbell. And, you know, you know, you look at everything that happens and you say to yourself, my goodness, why hasn't he evolved? Why hasn't it been elite? You need elite coaching Elite get clock management to get over the hump. It didn't happen, and it cost you. It cost you a couple games. You should, you you could realistically be seven and four. You could be six and five. If you know, the, the thing about this team is they're not good enough yet to overcome those inadequacies of the head coach. They're not good enough yet to 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 basically have these missteps that put them in bad spots. We talked about this before. The coaching staff really has to put them in good positions to win games. They have to be put in positions to succeed. When the coaches are stacking the deck against them and putting them in bad spots, this team isn't going to win games. And look, we had, we had what, three straight games where, where the coaches put them in good spots to succeed, and then you turn around in this game and you basically erase a lot of that good favor by, by putting them in, in spots where you essentially cost them this game. And that's frustrating. And you, you just can't have that. You can't have that coming from basically your head coach, from, from, from the CEO of the football team. You can't have that. You can't at all. And the, the part now that pisses me off, that just really gets me mad, is Jared Goff comes out every time they say, they, they say things like, oh, my God, we're happy with the decision. Our receiver was open. Why would you trust Jared Goff? Why, when that play comes in, do you tell yourself, why is no, nobody screaming, go underneath, go underneath, do not throw it deep? Absolutely do not. Why is DJ Chark the top option? What on earth gives you the impression that that chemistry has been established? What, what tells you that? Why not run the football? Then if you don't get it on third down, you run it again on fourth down. You force them potentially to use timeouts. 
it bothered me because I would never trust Jared Goff to throw the ball 10 yards or more on third down and one. Why are you doing that? Great. It's a great route. Great. Ben Johnson can scheme guys open. Great. You need a quarterback that can get him the ball. You have to complete the pass. You have to have the right communication where uh, if Shark knows to zig, Goff knows to zag. Or Goff knows to put it in this spot where Shark can get it, where only he can get it. That was one of the worst thrown footballs I've ever seen. It's clearly miscommunication. A combination of a bad throw and Shark not coming back to the ball where Goff maybe thought there was some mind thing that he should know to come back based on a certain signal or position of a defensive back. But that's too complicated. It's third and one. It is third and one. And these offensive coordinators don't figure it out that you don't have to go. In what world do the Lions go for a kill shot? It's the fucking Detroit Lions. You don't go for a kill shot. You get the first down. You you, you have to assume that <laughs> this route, this combination of options is going to be very risky. So why do it? Why put yourself in that position when all you need is a yard? Six feet. You got your quarterback. Jared Goff is 6'4". I come up to his nipple. He's 6'4". Put his arm out. I saw it yesterday as I was gripping as your brother-in-law was uh, near coming back to whoop my ass in fantasy. Luckily, I held on to win as Jonathan Taylor started to get revved up, but he, he didn't display his full powers. I saw Matt Ryan huddle up, try to fake a snap, boom, put his arms out and got a yard. It's not that hard. You could have 10 people on the line. Just run the game properly and and do the things that you need to do. Your strength is the offensive line. Your strength is Jamal Williams. Your strength is not Jared Goff. So, uh, and I wish the reporters would just stop asking in a way where you say, do you regret? They never regret. They never say, uh, they never say we should not. I mean, Ben Johnson does. It was great. One of my favorite moments this year was one of the Lions PR staff opens up with, you know, your offense has been doing great, da-da-da. And Ben's like, well, well, hold on. We still struggle in this. So Ben Johnson knows how to spit the game the right way. He's like, yeah, we're doing good on this area, but the play call wasn't good because we didn't execute it. The play call is not good because you didn't execute it. He's going to say that this week. So I always give credit for Ben Johnson for saying it, but I want to get upset for him to keep calling it. You know, but Dan Campbell and Jared Goff, they never say, you know, yeah, in hindsight, it's easy to say this and that. Just don't do it. Put yourself in the best position to try and and win the game. So that's where I get mad is that they make the the easy decisions look really hard. And it would have benefited you. You forced Buffalo to take your timeouts. So I'm frustrated that that it was a loss. You, You competed. Great. You get credit for that. It wasn't a blowout. But remember, the NFL makes it harder for teams to recover in four days. Because if this game was a Sunday, they would have lost by 21 easily. Because it was Thursday, everyone's tired. Dan Campbell said it was going to be a mental game. And they lost, period. They lost it out. 23 seconds left. It stunk. I know we can make excuses, but the team was without Jonah Jackson, Jeff Okuda. It was going to be a long shot anyway. But I felt like the Lions could have had an opportunity to win this game for real. You could have had a real opportunity to win. Yeah, look, look, they they really should have won it. In, In the NFL... You play who you play when you play who you play. You know what I'm saying? Like 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 Josh Allen is banged up. You take that. You take that and run. They're not giving you anything for for Jeff Akuda being out. They're not giving you anything for anybody else being out. So you play who you play when you play them. They should have won this game. You can legitimately say that and believe that this team should have won this game. And whether they won by three or whether they won by six or seven, it doesn't matter. They should have won this game. And instead... You're 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 another loss in the loss column, and again you're looking up at everybody else. You have a you have a chance. You're on the outside looking in to get into the playoffs. You have a chance to make up some ground. On top of that, you have a chance on national television. You are the only game going on at that moment. You have a chance to announce that you have arrived. That this team is here, and this team is for real. Everybody glosses up Dan Campbell and what he does. Everybody wants to like Dan Campbell. Everybody wants to tell you how good the knee biter is. This was your chance to show everybody that it's real. And instead, your coach cost you twice in one game. And that's just not acceptable. It has it's to get better. That's acceptable. the part. It has to get better. When's it going to get better? That's the big question. That's the big question. Like, like I, I, I don't understand... I don't understand how this team or where this team has to go. I'm not sure if it's if it's as much as 
They just need a different quarterback. Look, I really want to like Jeff J- Jared Goff. I really want to like him. I want him to work. But this is a guy. He is essentially what he is, right? He's a guy who's going to throw a touchdown or two. He's a guy who's going to turn the ball over now and then. And it'll probably be in a moment where, where you don't need him to. Like, he ends up taking a safety in this game. You know, like, that hurts the team. You, you go back through this season. There are times where he's just coughed up the ball at very inopportune times. You need to have the perfect situation around him. So you know how me and you like to look to the future. You and I like to look towards towards the draft. We like to see what's going on. I'm not sure if if in order for this team to win, you bring Jared Goff back and you just you basically roll your entire your entire draft class into into the defense. Maybe grab uh, one, maybe two offensive pieces, and 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 you take another shot next year. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if, if that's what helps you to get better faster or if going out and getting your quarterback makes you better faster. I don't know. I really don't. For me, this game came down to bad coaching decisions and and a quarterback who couldn't complete a pass and, and actually made the wrong read. The right read was there. That play could have worked, and instead the coach and the quarterback cost you. And, and it's just it's frustrating. It is absolutely frustrating. But look, put all the negative aside. Okay. This team has a chance to do some things. I think you and I both believe this team is 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 in a position where they can make some noise. Is it unrealistic and unreasonable to believe that this team can win 5 of the next 6 games and possibly find themselves in the playoffs? Because I'll tell you this much, looking at the way the back end of the schedule lays out, these are these are what we would deem easy games. These are easy games that they're going to play. I believe this team is capable and should win five of the next six games. Oh, and be in a be in a position to be in the playoffs. I'll look. I'm I, honestly when I look at the schedule, I do believe that they should win six of the next six games because the the the, the one game where you might might not give it to them is Minnesota. Yep. And if you ask me, they beat the shit out of Minnesota. They beat Minnesota's ass, and they gave Minnesota that game. So if you ask me, they really should win six out of six, but I will hedge well, my bet, and I will say five out of six games. Is yeah, that that's unreasonable? that's a lot of close games. I'm looking at the Lions with their talent and their injuries. I think it's going to be four and two or three and three. And I was joking with a buddy, too. I was saying, you know, it could be the three that we don't think. They could lose to the Jaguars, beat the Jets, lose to the Vikings, beat the Panthers, beat the Bears, lose to the Packers. You know what I mean? It could be any combination of three and three or four and two. But, bro, look, the Jets are a step ahead, bro. They got way, If they play well mm-hmm. in New York, weather may play a factor in giving us an opportunity to run the ball. But I watched that entire game. They're better than the Lions. If they play— Dude, Jets, Jets are a very good team. Oh, they're a very elite team. They can play defense at a high level. They need quarterback play. They But, bro, they got Garrett Wilson. They got Elijah Moore. And they got guys— that can I like put- Mike White. I like Mike White a lot. I have no idea why he wasn't their starting quarterback this year. Exactly. Well, Doesn't it's big it money. Like, I know. I know what you drafted. And I know yep. you got to give the draft pick, the high draft pick, a chance. But I like Mike White. I like what he did last year. Exactly. So it's good. It, it, it's a lot better. But bro, this game against the Jaguars, just looking one one week ahead in, into Sunday, I like what the Jaguars are doing. It's going to be a. I think this game. Is coming down to the wire. It's going to be two teams that kind of mirror each other. Goff is a little bit better than Lawrence, but if ETN plays, I like Marvin Jones. I like Jamal Agnew. I like what Trevor Lawrence can do. I think this is going to be a back and forth kind of game where if you can get a turnover, it gives you an advantage. But I think this one could be very, very close in the fourth quarter. It could go either way. I think they need to win the game to renew confidence because you're you don't want to go into uh, three games in a row at home and lose all three of them. But I could definitely see the Lions losing to the Jaguars and beating the Vikings. Any combination of three and three, four and two, I think is doable because it's hard. You expect a team that just barely won three in a row to go out and win six, five of six games. That's really tough. You need a lot of breaks to happen. You need Show me that it's changed. It, Show me that it's different. Exactly. Show me that you're making that progress. Win five of six games. Oof, Let's go. That would be it awesome, man. That would be awesome. You got to get healthy. You got to get. When, when it's five or six games, five of six games. 
They're staring at nine and nine and eight. Nine and eight, man. Nine Good for you. Get you into the playoffs. I think seven and ten, eight and nine gets everybody to say, "Wow, you made over fifty percent improvement." Makes everybody happy. It's there. It's there for them. Their schedule looks good, so the Lions have to step up. Maybe even put a beating on the Jacksonville Jaguars. Make them realize, hey, you're coming to Ford Field. That it's not that easy to handle business. So I'm impressed. I want to see this game. I think it's going to be very, very competitive. Maybe Tony Khan will get a shot on television and have an opportunity to weigh in as well. Maybe he'll fly into Detroit to get a sense of Ford Field to see if there's a big opportunity for a big AEW show as well. Tony Khan, co-owner of the Jacksonville Jaguars. But, bro, they just came off of a win against the Ravens, and that should put a little pep in their step. But they play differently, obviously, on the road. They're a young team, up-and-down team. But they got some players. They got NFL players that should make this game very interesting. It's only a one-and-a-half-point spread, uh, Lions favored. So it's basically a pick em. So what do you got? Give me your bottom line. Who wins this game Sunday? Lions win this game. Yeah. I'm going to say it'll be close. I think it'll be 34-31. Oh, look at you high scoring, bro. It, 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 it seems like no that on paper. Played. But these guys run the ball. And, and in the manner in which they do it, it's plotting. It's like six minutes. The way the Lions score, if Jamison Williams was going to play, then I would consider a score like that. But the Lions are playing games in the 20s because they want to control the clock, play defense, limit the possessions. So I think it's going to be Lions 27 and the Jaguars 24 and a close game, final possession, maybe tie game. Maybe you get the money badger to win it late. It's going to be close back and forth. This one might be the game of the year, back and forth and real competitive with both teams not really doing as much on defense to make an impact. But we'll see. I think the Lions will get better. I think the break helps. The Everybody gets healthy. You're going to get a Cuda back. Uh, everybody gets a little bit fresher with the mini buy. So it's a big game. It's a big game. You you don't want to be four and eight because that just ups everybody's anger because everybody put this as a win. Nobody's really angry other than a couple people about the coaching with Dan Campbell because everybody put this as a loss to the Bills. Everybody circled it right when the season started. Loss. So however it came about, didn't piss people off and, just, and everyone was drunk and eating turkey. And so they're like, oh, it's a good game. We were entertained and you did enough to keep us moving forward. You, you had a three and one month of November now it's money time. Now you have to perform. Now it's a time to say, okay, you, you, you passed the midterm. Now you have to show us what you've learned over the last few weeks, and you got to put it together for a big test, and that is the Jacksonville Jaguars. I can't wait to break it all down with you next week. I hope it's a win because that would put a lot of things in perspective, get to five wins, gives you confidence against the, the, the Bears and the Jets. Oh, baby, maybe, maybe in a couple weeks. You know, the odds right now are only 10% that the Lions make the playoffs. You start winning, you start turning things around. But boy, did that Rams trade prove to be exciting because you're sitting right now with a 4-7 and seven record with the number three overall pick in the 2023 NFL draft. And that belongs to the Los Angeles Rams. So kudos to Brad Holmes for taking that extra pick and uh, willing to gamble a little bit and uh, really realizing that the Rams probably were going to take a step back this season. If you've agreed... If our takes are really off base, if you think that uh, Jim Harbaugh got lucky or you disagree with what's going on at Michigan or you think the Lions are on the verge of collapse because of what Dan Campbell's doing or you're not impressed with the close loss, hit us up at Detroit Podcast. We read it all. We engage with everybody. And we definitely appreciate everybody that reaches out. Anywhere you listen to your favorite podcast, just type in Detroit Sports Podcast and our content will find you. Make sure you follow Adam on Twitter at Adam R S T R O Z. Follow the network at Detroit Podcast. Cause this was a good broadcast, man. We're getting ever so close to number five hundred. It's a good time, man. It's a good time in sports. Keep working at it, man. We're getting there. We're getting there. It's a fun time, man. It's a good time now. College football, NFL action, and boy, let me tell you, guys. When the Lions are on a bye, enjoy football. I watch Cincinnati. I watched uh, Pittsburgh. I watched Monday Night Football. I watched the Jets. I was like, oh like a little palette of NFL football to cleanse your palate after watching the Lions for so long. And man, is it fun. So everybody take advantage now. Our Lions are back this Sunday, and we'll break it all down next week on the latest edition of Doc and Jock.